Hello and welcome to Business 360. I'm Shireen Bhan. The headlines we're tracking for you this evening. The Lal Street snaps a seven-day losing streak. The Sensex and the Nifty end in the red after some profit booking. The rupee remains on a tight leash below the 83 mark against the dollar. Rishi Sunak is all set to make his first address as the Prime Minister of the UK. The 42-year-old is Britain's youngest leader in 200 years and the first one of Indian origin. ICICI and Kotak Mahindra Bank deliver strong growth in Q2, but mid-sized private banks like RBL and IDFC first report a rise in slippages. PSU banks do not need any additional capital, say government sources who expect profits to touch 1 lakh crore rupees for PSBs this financial year. It's a tightrope walk for the government on the fiscal front. The finance ministry may have to rationalise spending to meet the FI23 fiscal deficit target as tax receipts may not be enough to cover additional expenditure and the non-tax revenue gap. The insurance regulator issues an exposure draft proposing amendment to reinsurance regulation proposes that the order of preference favouring GIC may be removed. Stakeholders have been given time till the 11th of November to give their feedback. WhatsApp services are restored after an almost two-hour global outage, the longest in the company's history. This is the first major outage since October last year, when all of Meta services like Instagram and Facebook went down. Delhi's air quality is the cleanest on Diwali since 2015, but the AQI grade still very poor. It did not, however, breach the severe mark. Warmer weather and winds may have helped disperse pollutants. Also on the show, sex education in schools can be a potent weapon against teen pregnancies in India. A special report coming up. Well, let's head straight to the Lal Street where the Sensex and the Nifty snapped their seven-day gaining streak due to profit booking. So we saw the financials and FMCG stocks dragging the markets lower today. The Sensex was down nearly 300 points and the Nifty ended below the 17,000 mark. Sonia standing by to take us through the market action. Sonia, yesterday, of course, we had the Mohra trade uh, uh, and today the markets resumed for a full day of trading. Uh, volatile but finally closing in the red. Well, it was a weak day for the market. After a very strong somewhat session, today the market chose to give up on those gains. The Nifty was down about 90-odd points by the end of trade, while the mid-caps saw an outperformance. In fact, from the top, the Nifty lost about 160 points from the highs of trade. So in that sense, there was definitely some profit-taking today. Let's first start uh, by talking about the losers because the entire FMCG pack was under a lot of pressure. HUL was one of the biggest losers after reporting a disappointing set of numbers, uh, followed by Nestle, Britannia, Asian Pay, which were the big losers in trade today. Reliance Industries also dragged its feet down about one and a half odd percent. And then you had profit taking in some of these names like Kotak Mahindra Bank that fell two and a half percent despite a strong set of numbers that the bank reported. HDFC, HDFC Life, ONGC were a couple of stocks that ended in the red. On the upside though, uh, you had IT stocks that batted for the bulls today. Tech Mahindra was up three and a half percent, followed by a couple of other names like Infosys, which have been big gainers this month as well. And auto stocks stocks did well. So Maruti, Suzuki, Aisha Motors, M&M were your top gainers along with something like a Tata Motors that was up about uh, six tenths of a percent. The mid-cap index had a better showing today and plenty of stocks in the broader markets hitting fresh 52-week highs. In fact, talking about that, you had a lot of banks at fresh highs as well. SBI, ICICI Bank, Bank of Baroda, Canra Bank and Federal Bank hit fresh highs today. Sonia, many thanks for the big international story. Rishi Sunak is the new Prime Minister of United Kingdom. He is all set to take over as the new Prime Minister. The 42-year-old will succeed Liz Truss, whose 45-day tumultuous term was the shortest ever in the nation's history. Sunak, the youngest ever Prime Minister in Britain's modern history, will be the nation's leader in seven weeks after winning a Tory leadership contest triggered by Truss stepping down. Sunak has ruled out a general election despite calls from the opposition. He said bringing his party in the UK together will be his utmost priority. Sunak's predecessor Truss in her farewell speech said that she believes brighter days lie ahead for Britain. I look forward to spending more time in my constituency and continuing to serve South West Norfolk from the back benches. Our country continues to battle through a storm. But I believe in Britain. I believe in the British people. And I know that brighter days lie ahead. Thank you. Well, that is Liz Truss making way for Rishi Sunak. Sanjay Suri joins us now live from London. 
Uh, Sanjay Sunak lost out to trust two months ago, but what a comeback it has been for this 42-year-old who is now all set to move into 10 Downing Street. Uh, uh, you know, you wrote a piece early this morning, Sanjay, talking about the disbelief in the Indian diaspora about Rishi Sunak's rise and what a rise it has been. But what is this going to mean for Sunak, the politician, given the fact that he takes over at a time when the party itself is so fractured? A historic moment. This is the first time that anyone of British Indian origin will be prime minister. A quite remarkable turnaround in history, considering that Britain was the colonial power that ruled India for more than two centuries. Now, this is, of course, a matter of history and a matter of sentimental pride. But after that uh, invitation to form government, it will be back to business. And the first sign of that business will be right here at 10 Downing Street. Prime Minister Rishi Sunak will then set out his policy. He will speak to the media gathered here. And that will be a very important policy announcement because that will chart out briefly, though, uh, the way he plans his government to go and where he plans to take the country by way of policies and by way of delivering on those policies and promises. Well, that is our colleague uh, Sanjay Suri there reporting from outside of 10 Downing Street. And you can catch our special coverage on News Centre at 5 p.m. right here on CNBC TV 18. We will be speaking with the former Minister of External Affairs uh, uh, of uh, State. Shashi Tharoor will join us uh, to take us through what he makes of Rishi Sunak's rise. Millions of WhatsApp users across the world were unable to send or receive messages as the largest instant messaging app faced the longest ever outage that lasted for almost two hours. According to reports, users in Asia, the UK, South Africa and Europe reported issues while sending and receiving texts and videos on WhatsApp. Several users took to the microblogging site Twitter to complain about the outage. WhatsApp's parent company Meta acknowledged the urgency to restore services, but no reason has been disclosed yet for the global outage. Well, a mixed quarter for the banking sector with big players like ICICI Bank and Kotak Mahindra Bank delivering strong growth, but mid-sized private sector banks like RBL and IDFC First reported a rise in slippages. Ekta standing by to put together the key numbers for us. Ekta, what does the banking report card look like for this quarter? Well, yes, I'll really start with the star of the banking space, which was ICICI Bank. Loan growth was at a 27-quarter high. ICICI Bank's global net interest margins came in at 4.31%, which was again at an all-time high. And ICICI Bank's gross NPA improved and was the lowest in 31 quarters. Kotak, net interest margins came above 5%, so 5.17% is where it came in at. So it was an improvement on a Q on Q basis. Loan growth was 25% on a year-on-year -year basis and slippages were below 1,000-odd crores. The street, however, seemed to be a little worried about the net interest margin sustainability going forward. And according to a lot of the brokerages, the valuations probably capture a lot of the optimism that we're seeing in the earnings as well. RBL Bank operating profit was down 26% year-on-year, which was the fifth quarter for year-on-year -year decline. Slippages were higher as well for RBL Bank at over 800 odd crores. IDFC First Bank, slippages remained elevated. Yes Bank, the profit was down over 30 odd percent year on year. That was because provisions had spiked up over 50 percent this quarter. Lastly, South Indian Bank, one of the smaller ones, but did see a sharp reaction on the upside. ICICI Securities upgraded the stock to buy from hold with a target price of 13 rupees. In this, they've said that the improving tra trajectory in the operating performance uh, sustained for the third consecutive quarter for South Indian Bank. Ekta, many thanks. And uh, staying with banks, but now on to public sector banks. Let's take a look at the likely profit figures for public sector banks. Government officials have told CNBC TV 18 that PSU banks are expected to register profits worth 1 lakh crore rupees in FI23 as compared to 60,000 crore rupees in FI20. This will be a 25% growth in PSP profits year on year. The government feels there is no need for fund infusion into public sector banks at this point in time as they are well capitalized. Now, Another CNBC TV 18 exclusive this evening. The government may have to rationalize its spending in order to meet its fiscal deficit target of 6.4% for the current fiscal. Sources tell us that the tax receipts, though buoyant, may not be enough to cover the additional expenditure as well as the big gap in non tax revenue. Sapna Das joins us now with the latest. Sapna, what could be the options the government considers? 
Well, absolutely right. Uh, some kind of rationalization expenditure uh, may be required and probably that's already underway as the uh, RE and the B meetings uh, are already underway. Uh, having said that, two important aspects here, of course, uh, burgeoning additional expenditure and also some uncertainty creeping in on the non-tax revenue side. First, on the non-tax revenue side, well, uh, no clear estimates as of now how much the RBI dividend could be and there could be some gap again on the disinvestment receipts. As far as the additional expenditure is concerned, somewhere around 3 or lakh Macro is a number that's floating around. Uh, uh, some uh, more additional demands may be coming in from the ministries, as as I just mentioned, the RE meetings are on right now. So maybe around three to three and a half lakh odd crore, roughly, uh, could be the fiscal gap that uh, we are talking about as of now. Uh, and going forward, uh, maybe the buoyant tax receipts uh, may not be sufficient to cover that. Uh, you know, if you look at direct taxes, well, they are projected to grow at around 30 or percent in the current financial year, which is fantastic. Uh, but despite that, uh, you know, they, it could be a tight uh, rope walk for the government as far as managing the fiscal is concerned. And let's not forget another thing. From next year onwards, they have to reduce the fiscal deficit by over 50 basis points every year because by FY26, the government has promised to reach a fiscal deficit before 4 point, below 4.5 percent. Hence, this year's number of 6.4 percent becomes very important. They should not slip on that. And as of now, of course, there is no plan for any uh, deviation from the fiscal glide path, but it's a tight fiscal, it's a tight fiscal rope walk. It is a tight rope the government will need to walk. Thanks very much, Sapna. Perhaps more uh, expenditure control measures on the anvil. Now, Delhi residents are breathing toxic air with air quality turning very poor and the air quality index plummeting to 326. Air quality deteriorated as people continue to burst firecrackers despite the government ban. However, this is the cleanest Diwali since 2015 and the condition is better than last year's Diwali when the AQI had burstened to 451. This is no cause for celebration, though it is still toxic air that we are breathing. Abhimanyu Sharma joins us now with a status update on the air quality in Delhi. Abhimanyu. Delhi witnessed its cleanest Diwali since 2015, despite the incidence of stubble burning and bursting of firecrackers. The air quality index across the national capital continues to hover in the very poor region and did not touch the severe mark, even as various chalans were issued and anti-pollution and anti-cracker drives were conducted by teams of Delhi police and the Delhi administration. Over 200 calls were made to the fire department yesterday after Diwali, which was 33% more than the number of calls made last year. Also, the system for air quality and weather forecasting and research, commonly known as Suffer India, said that there were various reasons behind lesser pollution levels on Diwali. Reason number one was better wind speed, which led to faster dispersal of pollutants. Also, the occurrence of an early Diwali in the Gregorian calendar ensured that there was more sunshine during the daytime and there was lesser cold in the air, which led to better dispersal of pollutants and lesser possibility of fog as well as smog. The AQI across Delhi NCR region is expected to improve over the next few days. However, a word of caution has been sounded by weather experts that as the winter is going to set in, there is a possibility that dispersal of pollutants will become more difficult, which may increase air pollution levels. Also, there is an expectation of 10% rise in air pollution due to the incidence of stubble burning as a, a wind is expected to blow from the northwestern side towards Delhi NCR. Abhimanyu, many thanks for joining us and let's hope that the wind speed does pick up because remember, while we're not in severe category, the air quality is still very poor. Time for us to head into a short break, but up next, sex education in schools can be a potent weapon against teen pregnancies in India. A special report when we return. Indian shoppers, when spending mode this festive season, be it gold, vehicles, consumer durables, home decor, garments, electronics, and even sweets and snacks, all categories have witnessed a sharp surge in buying when compared with last year. Shilpa Rani Peter is standing by with a roundup of what the festive sales report card looks like. Shilpa. 
Well, this Diwali seems to have brought the much-needed light to several sectors. Now, according to estimates from the Confederation of All India Traders, business worth 1.25 lakh crore was clocked in the period from the first day of Navratri till Dhanteras. And then on the Dhanteras Diwali weekend alone, about 45,000 crore worth of sales were clocked. That's what CAIT has said. And this was led by jewellery, which clocked about 25,000 crore worth of sales. And automobiles, electronics, sweets and snacks, home decor, etc. made up the rest. Now, talking about Gold alone, according to the India Bullion and Jewelers Association, 39 tons of gold worth 19,500 crore rupees was sold on the Dhanteras Diwali period on, over the weekend, which is up 30% from last year. Now, consumer durables also, which saw peak season, uh, saw sales being led by televisions, refrigerators, washing machines, especially in the mid and the premium segment. Now, according to the pe uh, people in the industry that I spoke to, mid and premium segment is what led the growth, and that's about 25 to 30% volume growth and about a 50% uh, value growth over last year. But pain persisted in the entry-level segment, which saw actually volumes decline by about 10 to 15%. E-commerce sales also concluded about two, three rounds of their festive sales as we speak. And while the latest data is not available yet, a Shopify report expects sales of nearly $12 billion to be clocked. Now, remember the first leg towards the end of September, which was the first week, that itself had seen about $5.7 uh, billion or ra rather 40,000 crore rupees worth of sales being clocked. But we're yet to get a sense of how retail or even travel did as most companies in the and industry bodies are saying that they're yet to ascertain the response and give out uh, specific data. Back to you. All right, Shilpa, many thanks for joining us. Well, back to the big story that is breaking across our screens. Rishi Sunak has now been appointed as the Prime Minister of the UK at 42. He is going to be the youngest Prime Minister in over 200 years of Britain's history. He succeeds Liz Truss, whose 45-day tumultuous term was the shortest ever in the nation's history. Uh, remember, this is not going to be an easy task for Sunak. It's been an impressive perhaps even miraculous comeback for Sunak, who lost out to Liz Truss. But he takes over at a time when the UK economy finds itself uh, in a very precarious situation. Inflation at multi-decadal highs. Uh, there are, of course, uh, concerns on energy bills, which are skyrocketing. The, uh, the power to spend has been uh, significantly impacted. Remember, Liz Truss had announced a series of budget cuts which then had to be undone. So it, is, uh, it has been a period of immense volatility as far as the UK economy is concerned. So it's not going to be an easy task for Rishi Sanak. Remember, he was, of course, Chancellor of the Exchequer uh, as well. Add to that the problems within the party. He takes over at a time when the party finds itself fractured. The opposition has been calling for a general election. So this is going to be a challenge that Rishi Sunak takes on but nevertheless, history in the making. He is the first British Asian, the first of Indian origin, uh, and at 42, one of the youngest in over 200 years to take over the position of Prime Minister. Well, on to the other story that we've been tracking, and this is a CNBC TV 18 special report. Teen pregnancies remain a big problem from India. From 7.9% in 2015 16, the percentage of teens aged 15 to 19 who are already mothers or have begun bearing a child has slipped only monthly to 6.8% in 2019 2021. And that's as per data collected by the National Family Health Survey. Experts agree that there are many possible solutions to this problem, one of them being better sex education in schools. But CNBC TV 18's Kiran Khan finds out that this avenue faces and continues to face stiff resistance. Take a look. Fifty-three thousand eight hundred and seventy-four. That's the number of cases registered under the Protection of Children from Sexual Offences Act in 2021. These cases make up 35% of the total crimes against children recorded that year. And experts believe, while it's by no means a silver bullet, one possible method of bringing down this number could start with the Indian school system itself, by making sex education an intrinsic part of the curriculum. They argue that this should start from primary classes itself. From the time a child is one, you can talk about body parts, privacy, um, safety, consent, boundaries, body autonomy, um, and, you know, periods and stuff like that. But to talk about sex or baby making, you can wait till the child is five or six or even seven. 
but they add that sex education should not stop there and in higher classes should go beyond just AIDS awareness and the clinical explanations of menstruation and sexual intercourse which are largely restricted to biology textbook. We could definitely look at including uh, more information around changes that's a, that are happening in their body, uh, in their mind during adolescence. Uh, of course, menstrual hygiene management, uh, nutrition, uh, consent and violence uh, co concepts that are that they are exploring as they are growing about body diversity. What is the importance of sex education? To protect people and businesses with schemes like furlough. There are always limits, more so now than ever. But I promise you this, I will bring that same compassion to the challenges we face today. The government I lead will not leave the next generation your children and grandchildren with a debt to settle that we were too weak to pay ourselves. I will unite our country, not with words, but with action. I will work day in and day out to deliver for you. This government will have integrity professionalism and accountability at every level. Trust is earned and I will earn yours. I will always be grateful to Boris Johnson for his incredible achievements as Prime Minister and I treasure his warmth and generosity of spirit. And I know he would agree that the mandate my party earned in 2019 is not the sole property of any one individual. It is a mandate that belongs to and unites all of us. And the heart of that mandate is our manifesto. I will deliver on its promise a stronger NHS better schools, safer streets, control of our borders, protecting our environment, supporting our armed forces, levelling up and building an economy that embraces the opportunities of Brexit, where businesses invest, innovate and create jobs. I understand how difficult this moment is. After the billions of pounds it cost us to combat COVID, after all the dislocation that caused, in the midst of a terrible war that must be seen successfully to its conclusions, I fully appreciate how hard things are. And I understand too that I have work to do to restore trust after all that has happened. All I can say is that I am not daunted. I know the high office I have accepted and I hope to live up to its demands. But when the opportunity to serve comes along, you cannot question the moment, only your willingness. So I stand here before you, ready to lead our country into the future, to put your needs above politics, to reach out and build a government that represents the very best traditions of my party. Together, we can achieve incredible things. We will create a future worthy of the sacrifices so many have made and fill tomorrow and every day thereafter with hope. Thank you. Well, that is his first address, sir.
The newly appointed Prime Minister of the UK, Rishi Sunak, there saying he understands it is a difficult situation. He understands that this is a challenge, but he is ready to take on the challenge. Also, importantly, making it clear uh, that he will do what it takes to try and steer the ship out of the very troubled waters, especially on the economic front. The UK finds itself very, very precariously poised. Uh, Sunak acknowledging that, acknowledging the fact that this is a very difficult time for the country, uh, but also saying that it is a debt that this government will have to settle and not leave it for generations next. Uh, it is not going to be an easy task for this man, uh, but that is Rishi Sunak at 42, the youngest prime minister of the UK. Many firsts there to his credit, the first uh, prime minister of the UK of uh, British Asian heritage uh, of Indian origin as well. We will, of course, be tracking that story closely and bring you more on the impact as well as the implications for Sunak. That's coming up for you on the News Centre at 5 p.m. That's a wrap on this edition of uh, Business 360. Stay tuned. The news continues here on CNBC TV 18.